I uh, grew up in Colombia, and unlike what most people believe, uh, bamboo is not just from Asia. It is actually original to, uh, well, native to all continents except uh, Europe and Antarctica. So what is bamboo? It's a giant grass. It's part of the Gramini family, so it's fundamentally not a tree. There are over 16, I said there are 1,500 actually, there are over 1,600 now known species in the world of bamboo. And it's native to all continents except Antarctica and Europe. Um, one of the impressive things of bamboo is its growth. So it reproduces primarily in a vegetative manner. So that is through mainly the expansion of its root network. Um, I recently read that it can create this network can contain 100 kilometers within a hectare. So it's a very, very strong uh, network. And this root network can live over 100 years. Not that the uh, culms, which are the stems, which you see here, this is a stem just emerged from the ground, uh, live very long. They live for the most uh, 10 years. Um, and it grows incredibly quickly. Um, some species are known to grow as quickly as one meter in 24 hours. And this giant species, which is one from Colombia, which is called Guadu angustifolia, um, it can reach 25, even 30 meters within three months. So the speed of growth of bamboo is phenomenal. It only undergoes primary growth. So it only grows upwards. It doesn't become wider. So this big whopping piece of bamboo I've got here, it's not because it was old, like we'd expect in a tree, it's just it emerged from the ground being big. And presumably that emerged from the ground being big because the root network was mature enough and strong enough and in the favorable conditions of you know, soil conditions and rain and so forth to produce a large stem, but not because it's old. And then the other interesting aspect from the structural point of view, I'm a structural engineer, um, it's ready to harvest within three to five years. And so if you have corrected the data, there's over 1,600 species. And there's a wide variety. Um, some of them, like the one I've just shown you before, they grow separate and some grow really close together. One of the things that's really appealing about bamboo, and one of the reasons why I'm keen to talk to you in core about bamboo, is its element of sustainability. In fact, lately we see lots of people um, greenwashing, shall we say, products by linking them to bamboo. Um, and so let's quite understand why it's got this great uh, appeal of in terms of sustainability. So the first thing is due to its quick growth, we could arguably say it's a rapidly renewable resource. So say like timber, it's a renewable resource, but it's a rapidly renewable resource. By substituting other forest products, it can reduce pressure on primary forests. So if we exploited more bamboo, we could reduce pressure that we might have on primary forests for forest products. This root network continuously is producing the stems or columns. And um, this means that we can be harvesting some stems without having to chop all of them down, which means there's always a green uh, forest cover that allows that uh, any associated species can still have uh, a haven while you're harvesting the, the, the stems. The harvesting, if done properly, so that you extract only a certain percentage of the mature stems, can be done with little impact to the overall health of the forest and the root network. Harvesting it is um, really simple. You don't need expensive tools or anything. And to re retrieve a stem from a bamboo forest doesn't require expensive machinery. So it can provide a livelihood to rural communities. It also, of course, offers the aspect of carbon capture, which is uh, an appealing aspect that I'll discuss more in a moment. The root network also fulfills another series of roles. One is that it can control erosion because of its this great network can hold soil back. 
and also helps in the water cycle regulation, controlling for flooding and then also controlling for droughts in other periods. Also, the root network can, uh, can store a lot of carbon for a lot of time because, as I said, it lives at least 100 years. Growing bamboo requires um, very little fertilizer and pesticides. And then, for example, in China, they've been using it as a windbreak, which is uh, another environmental consideration. And it can help to restore degraded soils. There's quite a bit of documented in China about how they've used bamboo to restore degraded soils. Now, as I said, I'm a structural engineer. And so um, an aspect that interests me is how it comp compares to other materials. So here is one potential use of bamboo, uh, which is, for example, substituting steel. So here we have common form of steel that we use. It's a light gauge steel, so it's very thin little steel section. Uh, it's cut, it's rolled into a Z shape. And its stiffness, when you try to bend it, what we call flexural stiffness, is similar to this, uh, this hypothetical section of bamboo, which is 150 millimeters diameter. So this one's 142 deep, this is 150 millimeters diameter. So they're similar size, they have a similar stiffness, and um, if you push them to the limit, the steel plate would be beam would be slightly bigger. But functionally, we could say they're an equivalent functional unit. If this um, bamboo is used within 500 kilometers of the source, it would have nearly a seventh of the carbon impact that using steel would have, and that's without considering. Uh, any benefits from carbon sinking. So put this simply, to use this instead of steel for some uh, applications like uh, holding roofs up in warehouses, schools and housing, would use a seventh of the carbon and that's without considering any potential for carbon fixing. We did a paper where we looked at different types of housing in Colombia, this time we did consider carbon fixing, and we these uh, this orange represented a single-story um, reinforced masonry house built in across. The hypothesis was looking across different cities and different sources of the material, and this was an option where we didn't use brick, but we used concrete, a hollow block, slightly smaller uh, embodied carbon. And this one was using a technique with bamboo that I'll show you later on. So you could sequester carbon, you could fix carbon and have a significantly lower carbon in, uh, footprint. This was one where we looked at multi-story concrete and brick. And this was using a technique of laminated bamboo as an alternative. And this is also a single story house with uh, laminated bamboo. So overall using bamboo was much, much better than using um, masonry. We were asked by the reviewers, why didn't we consider timber in this scenario? And the, the answer was, is that we didn't feel that the timber industry in Colombia, where this paper was located, was mature enough to uh, have, um, to be considered as a sustainable source. In terms of carbon sequestration, this is not my research field, uh, but I've, there are, I do work very closely with an organization called INBA, which is International Organization for Bamboo and Rattan. It's based in China. It's an intergovernmental organization, and they have lots of publications on this topic. Here are two that I've just going to quote some stuff from. So one of those publications, they considered uh, the growth rates of a Chinese bamboo species, uh, Philostachys puensis, commonly known as mozo, and a Chinese fern. And here we have uh, the net increment of carbon of the timber forest, which is in it, it you plant it, it grows, it gets a point where it starts sinking more carbon than um, the bamboo, but then you harvest it and then 
you have a similar cycle and so forth. What's interesting about the bamboo is that it grows and then it comes to a plateau if you're managing that forest. So if you're regularly extracting bamboo stems that are mature, then it generally continuously starts uh, replacing those columns. And if those products that you are, if out of those stems you make durable products, you are fundamentally fixing this carbon um, in the built environment. And as you can see, you can do it at a pretty steady rate. The, the authors also had, that I've not included in my images, what would happen if the forest, the bamboo forest, is not managed? So you're not extracting the mature columns. Well, fundamentally, what happens is those stems die and rot, and a lot of the carbon dioxide goes back. Uh, a lot of the carbon goes back into the atmosphere. So what you have to do with the bamboo forest for it to be a good carbon sink is you have to be harvesting it continuously. And here they have uh, accumulated. Uh, carbon sinking and so here you see how it over time it accumulates more than the timber forest. There is a very important thing to point out about this is that bamboo would produce a better quality material than the Chinese fir. So though they seem to be producing fairly similar amounts of carbon uh, sequestration, the quality of material in terms of strength of the bamboo is better and we'll come back to that point later on. This is another of those documents that I've mentioned. So this is, um, in this one, they present some more complex ideas and I'm, I'm no expert in the world of carbon fixing, but I, I think they're uh, seductive ideas, shall I say. One of them is that we have what they call total ecosystem carbon. So for a type of bamboo species, you could fix above ground, below ground, and soil organic ca carbon uh, per hectare, uh, something like 156 tons, which is pretty impressive. But if you compare it with the Chinese fir, the Chinese fir probably achieves more. If you don't have a managed plantation, then it's not particularly good. And these are just two different bamboo species. One is from Latin America and one is from China. But what's really interesting is if you uh, start harvesting the stems, how much carbon gets then stored? That's another amount. And then the other idea, which uh, some of you might think is more uh, contentious, is an idea that's proposed of uh, carbon uh, displacement, which is because bamboo, as we'll learn in a moment, is so strong, we could displace uh, materials, like my example of the steel beam. So there is also an equivalent there that bamboo, because it's very strong, you could displace more of um, other materials than, say, the Chinese fir could, because it's not particularly strong. So overall, in these calculations, which you may disagree with, the authors propose that from a hectare of uh, bamboo in a managed plantation, you could sequester or uh, and displace the order of th between something like 300 and 400 tons of carbon, which is extraordinary. Um, so that's one of the things that is very, very seductive of this argument. I'm mentioning in passing a paper that was published this year uh, where it presents again the idea of buildings as car global carbon sinks. So they present these authors that one idea could be that we fix carbon out of the atmosphere through timber products or bamboo products and uh, gradually remove carbon from the atmosphere by fixing it into the built environment. So how is it that we process bamboo? Uh, and so I'm going to tell you a bit about the ways you can use bamboo. So here's some photographs I've taken from Colombia. Um, now, this is the simplest way of using bamboo. It's just getting the stems and they clean them and then they put them in a solution uh, that fixes a preservative. Bamboo has very little natural durability. 
So you must do something to it to increase its natural durability. And one of the ways they do it is through uh, using borax-based solutions in which you dip the bamboo uh, so that it absorbs the bor borax. Then they dry it through a series of stages. Here it's just air drying, then they put in a solar dryer, and then, then they put in a mechanically uh, uh, forced drying procedure until it turns from green to yellow and it gets to the adequate moisture content. That's one way of using bamboo. Another one is to make uh, different sort of products. This is maybe the one that you might be familiar uh, from products that you might see in your day to day. So here you get a piece of bamboo. This is a photograph I took in Ecuador. They cut it several times, then they cut it again until they make a sort of rectangular section. Then you get all these rectangular sections and you glue them together. And you can make all sorts of products because fundamentally comes like a lump of wood. So you've probably seen something similar like this in flooring, chopping board. Small structural elements made, and this is a photograph in China. In China, of how you can make uh, the, the different sort of uh, what we could call engineered. I, as I think I mentioned before, I'm a structural, and so what. I take a lot of interest in because I want to use it for structures. So just a bit about its uh, uh, microscopic uh, uh, makeup, its anatomy at the microscopic level. So bamboo has got uh, some parts called vascular bundles, which combine the xylem, the phloem, and fibers surrounding it. And then that all sits in a matrix of parenchyma, which is the spot of bamboo. Um, Towards the inside of these vascular bundles are bigger, and as you move towards it, they get smaller until you get to the epidermis. Back to the, that aspect later on. With natural materials, um, if you work out their strength, you typically get a log normal distribution like the one I've shown here. And we structural engineers will use for strength something called the character characteristic strength, which is roughly the fifth percentile. So the values that I quote refer to as characteristic strength. Bear in mind that it doesn't represent the mean strength. It represents something really quite conservative to the left-hand side of the distribution. So there is stacks of capacity and strength uh, in it. And all these come from some tests that we did at Coventry University in, in bending bamboo. So what I wanted to point to here is that we've done many tests at Coventry University. We have bent the bamboo. We have cr compressed it along the uh, direction of its axis. We've sheared it. We have applied tensions perpendicular to it uh, and so forth. And so what I want to point out here is that if you look at it in terms of its bending strength, that bamboo species that we brought, which was brought from Colombia, it roughly equates to a bamboo that, to in terms of timber, which I know this is sort of meaningless to you, but that is like a good oak. Um, in compression, if you sort of compress it in the direction of its fibers, it roughly equates to a tropical, to the very best of the tropical hardwoods, and uh, better than concrete we use on most projects. There are some higher strength concretes, so uh, you have to use this, the word high strength concrete with caution, but the, the concrete that we use in most projects. But just think about that. In You get a product that takes three to five years to be ready to harvest it that has the properties of oak. It does have some weaknesses, and some of these properties are quite low, and it sort of behaves um, like a weak softwood. So let's put this in the context of materials you might be familiar with. So when we pull it, 
parallel to its fibers in tension, it's got a roughly the third of the strength of steel. Bear in mind, this is a characteristic value, and I told you what a characteristic value is. It's a conservative value. Uh, but steel weighs 12 times as much. So in terms of strength to weight, bamboo is stronger than steel, and this, at least in this property. When you bend it, it's roughly like hardwood. Uh, and as I've explained to you in my example of the steel beam, it's uh, comparable with a steel beam. Um, in terms of compression, when you compress it, it's roughly the strength of a good concrete. But remember, concrete weighs four times more. In terms of bending it, many people think, oh, bamboo is so flexible. Well, it really isn't that flexible. It's just so, it's so incredibly slender that we think it's flexible. It is um, stiffer than most of the woods we use on a day-to-day -day basis, which is softwood. But it's still a twelfth of the stiffness of steel, but steel is 12 times heavier. So it roughly works out, as per my example of the being um, equivalent to sort of steel. They have some weaknesses, and anything that has to do with the parenchyma is not great. So in terms of in shear, it's roughly like softwood uh, and in terms of and it's still better than concrete which is not particularly good in 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 shear but much weaker than steel and in tension perpendicular which is when we try to pull it apart if you, if you like sort of pulling it like this um, it will it will split and it's really quite weak it is as weak as as weak as softwoods and so it's a material that has got some strengths but it also has some weaknesses. Um, nature has been very efficient in using material in bamboo. And one of the clever tricks is, of course, making it hollow. Because by making it hollow, it makes a more efficient use of the material. It puts it towards the outside. And um, that is what we call in structural engineering, increases the second moment of area or the moment of inertia. It's got those nodes that you see at regular intervals, which help to avoid buckling. It's got very, very strong fibers. So if you look at this photograph, these dark zones where the fibers are, if you isolate those fibers, they're incredibly strong. They're about three times stronger than steel. And then the last clever trick that nature has done is that it has pushed the fibers towards the outside of the bamboo, the smallest and most densely packed, where they're working even better, making it, it the cylinder even more efficient, 10% more efficient. So it is a beautifully engineered material. So there are fundamentally uh, two ways of using bamboo, other than, of course, transforming it entirely into an engineered product that I've been working with. Um, so there's a long tradition in any part of the world where there is bamboo of locals using bamboo. This is uh, some photographs of a uh, use of bamboo in Colombia used by natives. This is a modern sort of approach to the same idea. An even longer span version. This is a, a footbridge in a busy road in, in Bogota. And then this is a, a photograph I always find very ironic because the architect and uh, builders for this bridge were Colombian, but they went to China. So what I always find uh, an interesting irony is that some Colombians taught Chinese how to use bamboo. Uh, which is a great irony because the Chinese are, in all other respects, the most advanced in terms of using bamboo. This is also a photograph from Colombia. It's a church and community hall. It's not finished. It's a very hot location, and that's why it's quite open. This is a, the roof of a structure I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, it's the clubhouse of a uh, golf club in a very hot location. And this is uh, me with a community a group of um, members of an ISO committee that we took to visit this structure. You can do use it in, as a toll booth, or this was uh, a structure that was mainly to, was going to be built in Expo Hanover in 2000. And the Germans insisted that a first version was built in Colombia to demonstrate the adequacy of it. So they built this one to be tested, and then they built the other one in, in Germany, 
the one in Germany was eventually demolished, but this one uh, still remains. There is a housing technique which I take a lot of interest in, uh, which is used across Latin America. Um, and in the case of Colombia, its evolution came from uh, when native uh, when people from Colombia displaced into a region that was um, now which is now known as a coffee region, and they brought with them uh, Spanish architecture and te techniques. And one of those was rammed earth, but rammed earth doesn't perform very well in earthquakes, and this is a seismically active location. So um, eventually people perceived that the better way to build one was a technique which is not very different to our wattle and daub here in the UK, which combined timber and bamboo, which they call bareke. Um, the, this is not a bareke building, but it gives you the principles of how it works. It's got some bamboo columns combined with some timber elements and then some bamboo elements maybe holding the roof uh some bamboo elements holding in the the roof and so forth so it's a hybrid of timber and bamboo and then finally apply a render onto it later on i'll show you some photographs of, of modern bareke shall we say these houses these haciendas shall we say they've been around for over 100 years in the coffee region of colombia and they perform very well in earthquakes and uh, they look uh, quite pretty uh, and as I said, they're a hybrid of bamboo and timber. Here you can only see timber on view because people didn't like bamboo in those days. They thought it was ugly and they just tried to conceal it. This technique has been modernized and uh, we sometimes call it engineered bareke. And it's been uh, uh, exported to Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, Costa Rica, and more recently uh, to the Philippines. I'm also trying to persuade uh, a body in Jamaica to adopt it in Jamaica with a local species of bamboo. These photographs are from a project in the Philippines with whom we have uh, as Coventry University a memorandum of understanding. It's a charity uh, that works, uh, it's called Base Baha'i and they work with communities in trying to um, adopt bamboo housing. So here you see a bamboo frame going up, combined with some timber. Then they put this expanded lath onto it. And finally, onto this expanded lath, they put a mortar, cement mortar. And then that's you have the house. They're pretty simple houses. They're, I think, something like $3,000 each, so they're cheap. Uh, but more importantly, they're um, earthquake and um, typhoon resistant. They've demonstrated so far to be very resilient in typhoons as well as what we already knew from the Colombian history of being earthquake resistant. Here is a photograph, uh, sorry, a video of some a test carried out in the Universidad de Los Andes, as a university in Colombia, to a two-story uh, house of this technique. Um, this is a test undertaken on a what's known as a shake table. It's a single degree of freedom. Um, and it's already been tested once, and that's why it's already got some cracks, or, or several times, in fact. Um, when the earthquake is over, the damage is quite small and it's easy to repair because it's just mortar render that's been damaged. Um, in fact, anecdotally, they ran this test many times and they couldn't make the house fall, which was one of the things they hoped to see because they would understand the failure modes. Eventually, they just had to take a sledgehammer to it and knock it down uh, with a sledgehammer. Here are some examples of sort of social housing as well in Colombia using the technique. And this is not social housing. This is uh, uh, a more luxurious house in that golf club that I show you earlier. Now, one of the fields I've been working in, and I don't want to bore you too much with aspects of structural engineering, is the development of standards and codes. Uh, and as um, Marco pointed out, I have been, I've written, well, I've led two uh, ISO standards around the use of bamboo. 
and I'm currently uh, working alongside a team of other uh, experts in the development of uh, a third. Now, over the last 20 years, lots of standards and codes have emerged around uh, using bamboo. The first one, ironically, started in California, but it was a pretty useless document. All it told you was how to de derive some design values, but it didn't tell you how to design a beam or a column or anything, really. Later on in Colombia, following an earthquake, they developed a, a simple standard uh, in 2002 that contained a bit more information of how to design walls, shear walls and columns, but it wasn't much more useful. The really important, the breakthrough came in 2010, 10 years ago in Colombia again, uh, where they produced a standard that had lots of different things that were useful. It told you about mechanical properties and how to design and derive design values and how to design a beam and a column and connections and shear walls. And so it suddenly was a, a thing that allowed you to design a whole building. Subsequently, other standards have come across in other countries in the world. But again, they're not ever quite as complete as the Colombian one. And then the one we're hoping to publish next year with ISO, we think is going to be pretty groundbreaking. And it, ha it ticks every box and with great level of completeness. So we think we are laying the conditions uh, worldwide to um, create what we think is modern standards for the use of bamboo as stems, not the engineered transformed products, just as a stem or columns. So that's what has kept me busy. I've not talked too much about my own research. I just want to tell you about bamboo. Um, what I want to tell you is what is in on my mind at the moment. And one of the th things that I'm most keenest to do is disseminate the work we're doing on standards. We're very keen to work with uh, engineering bodies everywhere in the world that want to adopt bamboo uh, in their standards and advise them on how to, to, to do it. We have some collaborations. My, the one I'm keenest to uh, work on uh, more is with the organization the Philippines. Uh, it's, they've got uh, good funding. Um, they have got good contacts with communities. Uh, they've got access to the raw material, which incidentally is not particularly easy in the UK. I have a good collaboration with the USA, with Switzerland, uh, obviously with Colombia, because that's uh, well from my historical background with Mexico, I have also collaborated with Indonesia and we've got a project uh, in the cusp of being drafted with a university in Malaysia with which we Coventry has a memorandum of understanding as well. I've been invited to be a spe uh, editor of a special issue on bio-based materials in a journal called Sustainability and that's another project I've got in hand. And one of the other last things that I'm really interested in exploring is um, the combination of bamboo uh, with low grade timber. So species of timber that are not normally considered to be structural. We slap a laminate of bamboo at either end and then you can make some new products that have um, very interesting properties. So in that way you can use timber that would not be regarded as particularly good for structures as potentially as a structural product. We were working quite well in this field, but uh, COVID has slowed us down because there's a lot of lab work involved. Um, but it is one that I think is of interest, not just to developing countries in the tropics, but it's also of interest to the UK. Uh, and uh, again, if you have contacts with foresters or anything uh, who have uh, low-grade timber or something that could be interesting. I've also been interested in exploring of the use of low-quality timber, like say pallets and things like that. So it's, it's a really interesting option. Uh, the bamboo would necessarily be, at least for the moment, imported from tropics and subtropics, but the rest would be locally produced and it would, it would be potentially upgrading a material of low-grade. What could we co collaborate? This is just some wild ideas. Uh, um, I've put together. So can bamboo be grown in Europe as a source of durable biomaterials? The reality is that uh, though bamboo is introduced species to Europe, there are some uh, plantations um, in Europe, quite small ones, uh, that show that it's got potential. 
Uh, and if um, it could be argued that it, it produces bio, uh, durable and strong uh, materials that uh, could be used in construction faster than what software can do it, then might be a commercial case for it. Then, of course, the question is, should we be growing bamboo in Europe as a source of durable biomaterials? Uh, seeing that it's an introduced species, is, is that a problem? Bearing in mind that a lot of our commercial forestry in the UK, uh, for example, works with Douglas fir and Spicklis spruce, which have both introduced species, I, I don't see that it, that is necessarily a problem, but maybe we should be just looking at our own native species. But that's uh, an interesting point to look into. Um, but also, I wonder if 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 we could use it uh, in Europe as a part of a palette of plants used to recover degraded soils, uh, aiding soil stabilization and flood prevention. So is there another role that it could play? Because if if we could get it to do two things or three, so one, provide us uh, uh, a bio-based material for construction, two, act as a carbon sink, and three, fulfill another um, environmental service, is there a role? Now, note I'm using the word Europe a lot here, but I don't. it doesn't necessarily just mean I'm interested in working with Europe. It's just that generally when I have these sort of conversations, people are very interested in, um, well, the the, the the work you're doing because as I've pointed out I have really working in in, in other parts of the world um, and if you say well actually I would like to do it for Africa let I'd be delighted to so I'm just using the word Europe if Casey we just wanted to focus in here and of course then there are other questions I have which is can bamboo fulfill other environmental services which comes from the previous point which is uh, which I said, soil stabilization, flood, flood prevention, and so forth, uh, recuperation of degraded soils. It could it also be part of some strategy of green infrastructure uh, or other nature-based solutions. So that's sort of my uh, presentation. It took me less than 45 minutes. Um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know.